Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session, in fact, our last episode of this season, is titled Countering Disinformation in an Era of Pandemics and Conspiracies. We're joined by lead scholar Nina Jenkowicz from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for the Scholars. Uh, today is May the 6th, actually, 2021. Uh, my name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. And on behalf of my staff, uh, Libby Taylor and Mike Williams, as well as our graduate interns, Hannah, Carly, and Josh, I want to thank you yet again for joining us this evening for a uh, webinar. I know that uh, this time of year is particularly busy for all of you in a traditional classroom. Actually, it's busy for everyone, <laughs> regardless of what you might be doing. Uh, but I'm really pleased that uh, you're able to um, to set your calendar and join us for one last session. In particular, I want to welcome uh, and note the full spectrum of educators at different levels with us tonight. Norma is here from the 107th uh, Street Elementary School. Thanks for joining us, Norma. It's uh, great to see Loretta back with us. She's at Owen uh, Middle School, as well as Teresa, Centennial High School in Iowa. Uh, Jamie's in New, New Jersey. Great to see Jamie with us tonight. But we also have folks who may not be uh, in the traditional classroom, uh, guests like Jessica from the Shepherd Center and Jan from the Durham uh, Arts Council. Really, really pleased that we have such a wide and diverse group of attendees at what I think is probably one of the most important topics that we'll cover this year. The National Humanities Center, as you know, is located in Durham, North Carolina, and it is uh, led by the able and uh, very compassionate leadership of Robert Newman. Hey, Robert, I see you in the room tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, we, like all of your organizations, are uh, sort of winding up our academic year. We're starting to get to that point where we're, um, we're pulling back the books from our fellows. We're starting to you know, think through how our summer is going to uh, go, and we have full uh, hope and optimism to open fully in August to the new fellowship class. You can check out that new fellowship class by going to our website, and you'll see uh, right there on the main page, uh, the announcement of next year's uh, fellows. But, you know, in, in all the time that I've spent around scholars and all the, the wonderful, innovative, creative um, academics that we have at the center, I think one of the most common threads and themes that I find is that every single one of them understand the value of the humanities to help, under, to help uh, solve and address complicated issues in our world. Uh, that the humanities can help us understand ourselves uh, the humanities can help us develop empathy for others. The humanities can provide uh, uh, guidelines and maps and, um, and, and examples of how we can live our life to better get along and have a better life for everyone. And I'm really pleased that we're able to very directly tackle this issue of mis- and disinformation tonight. It's actually the second of uh, uh, during our webinar series that we've, we've tried to point directly at this and suggest that the humanities themselves can be essential critical skills for much of what um, Nina is going to share with us tonight. And I want to thank all the fellows who have joined us in this webinar series this year and look forward to introducing you to more of them in coming seasons. Don't forget, by the way, that the Humanities in Class Digital Library will remain a free and open site for you to use in your end of year planning and certainly in your summer planning for the next school year. Um, I'm very pleased that so many of you have library cards and you're beginning to work and create and share your instructional materials in the library. Don't forget, though, to also sign up for the webinar series group. Um, that's where you'll find uh, the folders that are associated with each of our programs, and you'll be able to um, find the recordings. You'll be able to find the edited versions and uh, also the other resources that we've curated uh, on your behalf. That does include resources for tonight's session. Uh, Nina was kind and, um, and uh, out in front of this enough to go ahead and give us some resources that will be in support of her, her session tonight. Please do take a look at that. And you know maybe if you haven't looked at them yet, you can use them in reflection upon what we'll share tonight and use those in your coming instruction. <clears throat> of course, it's not just the National Humanities Centers represented in this digital library, but also resources from many other uh, humanities-based organizations. And again, we're pleased to make sure that uh, you know this is free and open material, and you can use this um, in, in whatever way you'd like to modify for your instruction. Uh, I'm going to take a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take a moment and reflect a little bit on the year. You know, as an educator myself, there's something special about this time. 
um, you know, the spring brings uh, the conclusion of an academic year. Uh, there's many things to reflect on and be thankful for, grateful for. And this webinar series, I think, continues to be a wonderful way for us to connect scholars and educators. In fact, uh, tonight is the 45th session of this year's uh, season, and we have served a little over 17,000 uh, educators all across the country. And, you know, I, I think one of the most valuable currencies that all educators have is their time. And so, again, for you to find these valuable enough to spend uh, some conversation in the evening is, is really an important thing for us to, uh, to acknowledge. Um, in particular, I want to be clear about and sort of reveal a little bit about the ways that we put our series together, and I hope you see the same things emerge in next year's season. To begin with, again, what we really want to do is address complicated contemporary issues, things that are on your mind, things that your students are asking you about, things that might be in your curriculum or not. They might be things that your students need some clarification of, and I think one of the real values of this uh, series is by introducing you to experts in the field, authority voices who can help make sense of it. Of course, we aim this at the professional educator, but anytime you'd like to use the materials we share or the recordings of these sessions with your students in some form, uh, please feel free to do so. I think we've also really tried to emphasize the value of multiple perspectives in developing empathy. As you look back through the past year's schedule, You'll notice that we offered a lot of sessions on marginalized voices, on, um, on topics and, and perspectives of uh, trying to understand where other people are coming from and the experiences that they've had and the histories that we share. And I hope that you have a chance now as the year concludes to go back and maybe revisit some of those recordings and try to stitch those things together. We've tried to approach um, old topics in new ways. We've tried to offer and suggest that there are multiple entry points to your curriculum. Uh, if you're a history teacher, there are lots of different ways to teach history. Uh, if you're a, an English teacher, there's lots of ways to support an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach. And I hope you did find uh, many examples of how scholars are doing the same thing in their scholarship, offering you ways that uh, you can rethink how to make the curriculum and the content uh, more accessible and for your students to see themselves in that content. Of course, it's very, very important and tonight will be no different that the conversation you have is two-way. Um, although you'll only hear my voice and Nina's voice tonight, it's that chat box that's going to be the most effective way for you to communicate with each other, with our scholar, to ask questions, to be, uh, to try to formalize the ways that you can apply this to your teaching. I think you know, creating this environment that's very collegial and very familiar and very conversational is at the heart of how we try to uh, organize this, this season. And then finally, we try to contextualize the content that we know you're teaching. Um, there's a, there are many of you, the curricula that you're responsible for might have topics or might have moments in it where, you know, it's been a little while since you took that in a class or it's it, maybe your textbook and the resources your district provides aren't quite up to snuff. We try to, to provide you with not only some very in-depth resources during the session, but also uh, curated materials afterwards, and then give you some sense of how to uh, draw those, those contexts for your students. I hope we're successful, and I invite you to look at next year's series. In fact, you can go to the group that I mentioned earlier in the digital library and see the full schedule, including the dates and the scholars and the uh, topics. Um, I'm really pleased to be bringing again next year a little over 40 sessions that will feature uh, preeminent elite scholars who are sharing really powerful work. Uh, folks like Eddie Gloud, who will be working with us on September 16th on the legacy of James Baldwin, or November 9th when, um, uh, when Jody Armour from USC will be helping us better understand the LA riots of early 1992. Um, but this isn't just a history season. Uh, we also have lots of other disciplines that are represented, including literature, uh, as well as religion and art and geography. Um, registration is not open yet. It won't open until mid-August, but put that on your calendar and go into the library and take a look at what we've got planned. And I hope you already are able to identify some that you'll find interesting and compelling. Each of our webinars earn five hours of professional development. Um, and I can I, I know from many of the, the chat box conversations that we've seen, including Erica tonight, that 
you know, it's important to get a particular number of sessions so that you can report those to your district. If you've come up short or if you just want to spend some more time learning more deeply about these topics, I do encourage you to check out the Humanity Class online courses. Our next slate of courses begin on May the 17th, and they do each course does earn 35 professional development credit hours. These hours are recognized in Los Angeles Unified, as well as 20 states around the country. And you can find these on our website. Finally, I want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council. Uh, each week, each uh, webinar, I introduce several of them and, and thank them, but this time I'd like to thank them cumulatively. Uh, they've been just a fantastic cohort, particularly in such a difficult and disrupted school year. Their contributions, their attendance, their uh, thoughtful reflections on the work we do has, has really been a powerful part of the ways that we've designed our work, and I want to thank them directly. We are currently reviewing applications for next year's council, and we'll be announcing that uh, in another week or so. So thank you for allowing me a slightly longer uh, introduction tonight. Again, as the last episode of the season, I found it important, thought it was important to be both reflective and thankful for the work we've done this year. And that work does include all of the interactions that you'll give us in the chat box. So please don't forget to, um, to share your thoughts, share resources, share URLs if you like, if you have a formal question, though, please do use the Ask Professor Jankowicz tab, and that will come to me as the moderator, uh, and I'll bring it forward when the conversation uh, seems to make sense. Um, if for some reason your Wi-Fi gets dis disrupted, don't fear. You can either refresh your screen or log out and come back in. The system should still track your attendance, so that will not create a problem. Again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's session is titled Countering Disinformation in an Era of Pandemics and Conspiracies. I'm joined by Nina Jackwood from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Our TA tonight is not Wendy Harris, although Wendy is a fantastic TA. Instead, uh, Gerald Evans will be joining us. Gerald's a teacher in Enrico uh, County, Virginia, just outside of Richmond. And I want to thank Gerald for pulling together resources that we've also added to the Digital Library resource. Um, Nina, can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think you're somewhere outside of DC, is that right? Yes, I live in Arlington and it's great to be with you all tonight. Thank you for the invitation and thanks for attending on a weeknight. I really appreciate it. Well, uh, we're, we're anxious to hear uh, your experiences and your guidance. Um, I mean, this is certainly something that's on all of our minds and, and a concern of all of ours. And I at least am hopeful that we're going to hear not only a, sort of a summary, but also some really practical things that we might do. But I, I wonder if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a personal question to start the session tonight. Sure. And this is a, you know, this is literally the 45, 45th episode this year. Hundreds of these we've done, and I've never asked a lead scholar this question before, but tonight seems appropriate. Um, Nina, as much as you're comfortable, can you tell us about an educator in your life who really impacted you to think critically? Did somebody jump to mind? Did you have a teacher? Did you have an educator who you just feel on your shoulder telling you to be more critical about the world you're living in? Yeah, this is actually a pretty easy question for me to answer. Um, I, when I was in high school, was in our uh, debate club, which did Model UN and Model Congress. And um, the same teacher who ran the debate club was also our teacher for uh, AP U.S. history, um, as well as AP U.S. government. And uh, Mr. Fenster, who I am still in touch with today, really had a big impact on the way I wrote, the way I thought, the, the books that I read. Um, and frankly, you know, the experiences that I gained, not only in his classroom, which is very, very interactive, but um, but also in, in the debate club every week, you know, debating all sorts of issues that most high schoolers don't give second thought to, um, it really prepared me for the work that I, I do today, both um, in my research in, in the international affairs field, but, but also gave me the confidence that I need to do much of the work that I do, the outreach that I do, events like this, but also, you know, going on TV and radio. Um, and I was lucky enough a couple of years ago to go back and address the, the debate club at their end of year banquet. Um, and I was very pleased to see that the club, which used to be very, very heavily male, uh, now is mostly young women. Um, so I was just thrilled to see that. And uh, and yeah, I, I really am indebted to, to Mr. Fenster for the perspective that he gave me and the way 
that he pushed all of his students to um, consider different perspectives and to be able to represent them and think them through uh, both in writing and verbally. Well, cheers to Mr. Fenster, and thank you for being so uh, so willing to share that personal anecdote. And you know, I asked that in part because of I'm going to move the slide up. I'll go back in a moment because of the opening question tonight, which which directly addresses the role of educators in this this era of of disinformation that we live in. The quote on the left actually uh, was shared with us by a recent webinar speaker Heather Cox Richardson, who summarizes the the Daily News as an historian. And, and this quote from, uh, from Herb Lynn just, you know, just really resonated with what we're doing tonight. But it occurred to me when I created this slide that, you know, teachers are doing this already. They're doing it, whether they're doing it intentionally enough or not, or we understand the context of disinformation. Teachers are already the, at the front line of this defense. And I'm, I'm really anxious to hear how you can, um, how you can fine tune that for us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, uh, Herb Lynn and I, we were testifying at the same subcommittee hearing when he said that. So we have very similar, uh, very similar views on this topic. So let me just uh, advance the slides here. This is a little bit about me, um, what it is that I do. You know, I never envisioned myself working at a think tank. My career plans got a little upended. Uh, but let me let me kind of give you uh, the the short version of where I've been over the last couple of years. I uh, worked for an organization called the National Democratic Institute when I got out of graduate school, and my my background is in Russian and Eastern European affairs. I have two degrees in Russian, spent a lot of time in Russia, Ukraine, and the Baltic states as well as Poland. Um, and so I was working at this place that supported democratic activists. I mean, small D, not democratic party, but folks working for democracy around the world. And I, in particular, worked on programs related to Russia and Belarus. And our organization often got hit with a lot of uh, state sponsored propaganda. They thought that we were CIA agents. They thought that we were trying to bring about regime change. That wasn't really the case. What we were doing was trying to give people the skills that they needed to make their governments more responsive to citizen concerns, whether that was building a better playground, getting better uh, trash disposal, things like that, all the way up to um, you know, parliamentary campaigns and things like that. Um, the crisis in Ukraine, the, the invasion of Ukraine and illegal annexation of uh, the Crimean Peninsula by Russia happened when I was working at NDI, and I really wanted to get out into the field um, I, I felt like I needed to go and, and you know, put my skills to use uh, for the, the peoples and cultures that I had spent so much time studying. And so I applied for a Fulbright grant, uh, which led me to be able to advise the Ukrainian government on strategic communications and disinformation. And this was in 2016 and 2017, which was, of course, a very, um, I would say, influential year for disinformation in the United States and to be able to watch all of that from Kiev um, gave me a certain perspective that that really influences my work today and it's one that says you know America tends to be uh, we tend to have this sort of hubris about our approach to disinformation we think you know we're the only ones this has happened to but as I learned when I was in Ukraine and doing research for my book throughout Central and Eastern Europe that's very, very far from the truth. And we really can learn a lot from our allies in Eastern Europe that have been dealing with this problem, not just Russian disinformation, but disinformation writ large, much longer than, than we have. And some of those solutions have a lot to do with education, which I'll get to in a bit. But after I, I came home from Ukraine, I uh, started my, my affiliation with the Wilson Center, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, research institution that is partially congressionally funded. It is the living memorial to President uh, Woodrow Wilson, who is the only president with a PhD. And uh, I, I, can, I feel like I can say from my, my time at the Wilson Center that we are equally sought after by Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, we, we tell it like it is, um, and our own you know, personal uh, political inclinations don't color the work that we do. It's just about analysis. Um, of, of whatever we do. And we uh, have a great regional uh, research institution called the Kennan Institute, which I've been lucky enough to be um, affiliated with. It's named after George Kennan, who of course was one of the uh, famous diplomats who created the containment policy uh, after the, the fall of the, or after the end of World War II. 
Um, and I'm also affiliated with the Science and Technology Innovation Program, where we have done a lot of work uh, leading policy development around technology regulation and raising awareness about disinformation with the general public. I've testified before Congress four times in the last couple of years, and the last one was just last week. Um, and do a lot of media engagement, uh, try to engage with other countries that are working on these issues. And more recently, my research has focused on approaches to social media regulation and gender and disinformation. And you can look both of those papers up on the Wilson Center website if you're interested. Uh, I always like to start my presentations with this little cat. He looks a lot like my cat, but uh, it's not because of that that I put him in here. It is because the game that he's playing, like whack-a-mole, is very similar to the way that we have been uh, fighting disinformation in the United States. I like to say that we are playing whack a troll. Um, and I firmly believe that we need to really approach this problem much more holistically and focus a lot less on offensive content or harmful content and accounts and think about how we can equip people better to, uh, to navigate today's very confusing, very fast paced information environment. And that's for all of you come in. But before we go any further, I always like to define terms because there are a lot that float around when we're talking about dis and misinformation. Uh, and they're often used in interchangeably and it's not particularly helpful when we do that. So disinformation is false or misleading information that is spread with malign intent. So that might be a nation state or a political actor seeking to dupe people. That's a little bit different than misinformation, which is that same false or misleading information spread without that malign intent. So I like to say that's your uh, Uncle Bob or Aunt Jane at the Thanksgiving dinner table who likes to traffic in conspiracy theories. They're not necessarily doing it with malign intent. Sometimes we use the term fake news to describe uh, both of these phenomenon. It's not a particularly precise term and it has also been politicized a lot. Um, I actually, in my book, uh, you may have noticed in the, the subtitle of the book, it, it says fake news. That was something my publisher wanted to put in there kind of as a signpost for readers who refer to it as fake news. But I don't personally like that term. Um, and that's because a lot of the disinformation that we see, particularly coming from our adversaries uh, in, in foreign countries, it's not necessarily false. It's misleading, right? It, it plays on our emotions, and I'll get onto that in a little bit. Um, but it's not cut and dry fake news. And so it's a bit of a misnomer to call uh, this phenomenon simply fake news. So I don't like to use that term. Then we have propaganda, which is probably a lot more familiar to everyone here. Um, the propaganda of yesteryear that the Soviet Union or other countries might have spread is a bit different than what we see coming from Russia in particular today. Uh, Russia isn't necessarily trying to spread a view uh, on behalf of its government or persuade an audience of the, uh, of the Russian point of view. What it's trying to do is create chaos, and I'll get a little bit more into that later. What we see the Chinese government doing, however, is a lot closer to cut and dry propaganda as we know it. Um, if you look at what they've been doing during the, the pandemic, it's a lot about um, casting doubt on the origins of the virus or the efficacy of Western vaccines. And that is meant to benefit uh, the, the Communist Party in China in the long term. What is a troll? This is another one that we see thrown a lot. Uh, trolls and bots are often used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. A troll is an account with a real human being behind it. Um, and their identity might be obscured. Uh, they're usually engaging in some sort of inflammatory or misleading posting, but that's different than a bot. A bot is an account that is entirely operated by a computer program by lines of code. You might have one person controlling a lot of troll accounts, but a bot, you could, you could control thousands of accounts uh, if you have the computer code to do that. So that's the difference there. Um, Nina, may I interrupt just briefly and ask a clarifying question? I'm going to go back to that last slide. Um, sure. This question actually comes from Jake in Santa Cruz, and he's wondering if you can, it seems like particularly the definition of dis and misinformation is important now, maybe, maybe more important than propaganda and fake news, as you're suggesting. Is there a time when when it crosses, when it, when it, be, when it's one and it becomes another? 
when it's it's not being shared with malign intent, and then it does. Um, and is that a natural evolution of, of those terms? Yeah, it can go both ways. So often what we've been seeing is people who perhaps, let's say at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, got some bad information and were legitimately concerned about something, but it turned out the science didn't back that up. Uh, we would see Russia, for instance, latch on to a narrative like that and start to spread it to cause panic or to cause uncertainty and fear. But it can also go the other way. Um, mm -hmm. We have seen, uh, you know, folks who um, aren't necessarily aware that they are spreading Russian disinformation because, again, it appeals to them emotionally. It appeals to their interests or something like that. And they're spreading it because they think, hey, this might be good information, but not really looking at the source, let's say. Right, right. And this is actually something that uh, Russia has gotten really good at doing. We call this information laundering. Um, and in order to obscure the origins of the disinformation, they will find um, willing, uh, perhaps unwitting people on the other end who will spread it for them. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the yeah. presentation. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, wor words matter and language matters and the definitions, uh, you know, and that's why you're sharing it here at the beginning, but that's really the first step and how we can all better understand this process. Um, but it really does seem like, you know, identifying that motivation might be the key. Is is that correct? It is. And, and that does make it tricky for uh, the social media companies and for law enforcement who are trying to track this behavior and uh, clamp down on it when um, things are gaining traction, because often what we'll see is authentic local voices who are sharing some uh, disinformation that may have been laundered into the authentic ecosystem and now is misinformation. How do we crack down on that when it is, um, you know, a local voice, a normal person sharing it, not a not a troll sitting in St. Petersburg, Russia? Um, how do we how do we stem the spread of that information, particularly if it's going to cause harm to public health, public safety, or uh, or our democracy? Right. Thank thank you for clarifying that. Of course. So we've touched on this a little bit already, but disinformation uh, exploits what I call the trust gap. So this is a chart that's actually a couple years old already, although I would wager uh, if it were updated, it would show even a bigger gap in trust. This is from the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a survey done every year out of the UK, um, and it measures trust in institutions from the business sector, media, NGOs, and government to uh, the, the regular, you know, your ordinary citizens in, in all of these countries. And from 2017 to 2018, the U.S. saw a 37% decline in trust in institutions. And this is exactly what Russian disinformation in particular tries to manipulate. It takes these uh, pre-existing fissures in our society and amplifies them. It makes them even bigger so that we turn against one another um, so that we are consumed with the things that are going on at home and so that Russia gets a better seat at the negotiating table. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, but we often think, you know, influence, online influence, disinformation, this is just about, you know, fake accounts online, but it's actually much wider than that. We've already talked about bots and trolls. They will impl uh, amplify misleading and false messages online. But then we also have Russia using government organized NGOs or gongos as they're called, uh, fake front organizations and fake experts in order to lend credence to these narratives that might be shared by Russian state sponsored propaganda or these fake accounts. We see them using cyber attacks and cyber crime to inform what we call malinformation. So if you remember the hack and leak operation that affected the Democratic National Committee in 2016, that was malinformation. It's when uh, information that is not otherwise public is leaked into the public sphere in order to influence uh, influence the, the discourse. And that's exactly what Russia did with, with that hack and leak of the DNC. And then we have a couple of instances, and I'll, I, I'll talk about them in a little bit, of Russia funding and organizing protests and political parties. Depending on different rules in each country, it might be overt. Uh, that happened in, in Germany and in Austria, uh, but it might be covert. And we've seen that here in the United States. Oops, there we go. 
And Russia's goal in all of this, as I mentioned, is three pronged. The first is, you know, you might be thinking, why does Russia want to pit us against one another so much? Well, when the United States is busy dealing with its own domestic problems, we are a lot less likely to pay attention to what Russia is doing. And Russia has been doing a lot all over the world, just off the top of my head. They have intervened in Syria. They have propped up the Maduro regime in Venezuela. They have sent mercenaries to the Central African Republic and targeted people who were doing anti-corruption work there. Um, the list goes on and on, and that's leaving out the most obvious conflicts, which are in Russia's own backyard, that Russia you know, started itself, uh, frozen conflicts in Georgia and Moldova, uh, the, the uh, Republic of Georgia, of course, not the state, um, as well as the hot war in Ukraine, which has claimed already over 13,000 lives, uh, according to the United Nations. And again, when we are occupied with what's going on at home, we're not paying attention to what Russia is doing abroad. That's a huge boon for Russia. Um, the second thing that is really helpful to Russia is that when American democracy or Western democracy in general is faltering, that's great for Putin at home. He can say to protesters, and I, I saw someone ask a question about Navalny, which I'm happy to address a little bit later. Um, when there are pro large protest movements uh, demanding more democratic uh, actions and governance in Russia, Putin can, can say, okay, I hear you, you want democracy, but look at how democracy is working out right now in the United States. And just to use an example, this was some of the, uh, some of the precise and uh, almost exact words that Russian propagandists were using this summer when the Black Lives Matter protest movement uh, gained steam after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, they, they would point to journalists getting arrested or people being pepper sprayed and arrested and say, ah, look how, look how democracy is working out over there in that shining city on a hill in this very, um, very, you know, manipulative way. Uh, basically a whataboutist narrative that is able to prop up the Russian regime. And many Russians don't want to go out there on the streets and, and risk that sort of repression. Um, they're happy to continue the orderly society that they live in now, even if they don't necessarily have the democratic freedoms that we do, because they view those freedoms as risky. And Putin is very happy to remind them of that. And then the third goal is, and this is why I have this picture here of, uh, of Trump and, and Putin, I believe this was at one of the G7 meetings early on in Trump's term, um, this gets Russia a seat at the global negotiating table. Russia has been isolated since its annexation of Crimea and its funding of the war in eastern Ukraine. And by using this asymmetric warfare, as we call it, where they are uh, attacking us in the information sphere, um, but, but moving back in the kinetic on the ground battlefield, um, they're really able to bring us to the negotiating table. And Russia wants nothing more than to be part of the club of great powers. Uh, and frankly, I think in that way, they've been extraordinarily successful with these goals. Nina, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, it, and I'm going to ask this question. It's going to seem so elementary. It's going to seem so uh, obvious. And I'm also kind of imagining what some of the students in our audience's classroom might say. Mm -hmm. But it's super clear. I, I can imagine some students saying, really? This is really happening? Come <laughs> on. This isn't really happening. Because it does seem so um, overwhelming. Uh, it seems so science fiction in a way. But the premise here, and and I apologize, I'm asking you to be just extremely explicit because that's, it seems to me that's the key, right, is to recognize that it's actually happening. It's not just more things that we're hearing about. It's not misinformation in and of itself. This, this is the reality, yes? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book because I think so yeah. many people we're shocked that this could be real. And not only is it real, not only is it something that's happening in the United States, there's a long track record of it happening around the world. Certainly, right. you know, the, the Soviet Union practiced these techniques ahead of, uh, you know, the current Russia that we see today, ahead of the so social media era. Um, but it's something that's carried forward into the present day. And it is absolutely a technique of influence. And I would even say warfare. I agree with Dr. Lin, whose, whose quote you had at the beginning, 
um, it's it's an an effort by Russia to exact its influence um, where it really doesn't have any um, in, you know, it's not able to compete with uh, the Western powers in that way. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it is happening and we've done very, very little to stop it so far. I mean, that is the psychology of the big lie, right? Is that it's so big that it almost boggles the mind uh, and, and strains the, the, the credibility of, of it actually happening. But I, I think a finer point to make, though, is that this isn't just sort of the natural unintended consequence of the digital age and the Internet and social media. But there is a, a malign actor, Russia, who is, who is exercising these tactics. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's also I think a lot of people struggle with the idea that a, a foreign country might be able to get us to believe something that's not true. And that, again, I think is where we struggle a little bit with the the uh, lexicon that we're using. Yes. Um, yes. It's not that it's fake. Right. These are these are predilections that people in the United States or in Germany or in Poland already have. They're pre-existing fissures that Russia has identified. And this segues very nicely into this slide using social media, Russia is able to test all of these narratives and find exactly the narratives that are going to resonate most with specific audiences. I like to use the metaphor of them throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. They have a lot of spaghetti and they're happy to just throw it over and over and over until they find a really sticky spot on the wall. And then they'll keep throwing that exact same pasta shape at that sticky part of the wall over and over. That's what social media allows them to do through micro targeting. And that's why, um, you know, compared to Soviet propaganda, which was quite successful in, its, uh, in and of itself, um, this is a much more successful, much scarier weapon to be unleashed on all of us. Um, and there's almost no oversight. Like we've just started getting law enforcement involved in this stuff. Uh, that is why it was so shocking to see, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and a lot of the other social media executives saying it was, quote, a pretty crazy idea that uh, anyone could influence election results through social media. But we know that's exactly the service that they're selling to political campaigns. And of course, our adversaries are using that against us. That's exactly how it works. Th thank you for, you know, I'm, I'm sure in your work, it, it, it's almost something that you can assume, but I, I just feel like it's, it's that precise point, that, that sort of grasping it that's so critical. And I, I appreciate you, um, you know, really leaning into that uh, to that comment at this point. Yeah, my pleasure. And now I'll give you a couple of the examples from the book that um, show how long this has really been going on. I mean, this at this point is, you know, 15 years ago, we're talking about some of these campaigns starting and uh, the United States really did not wake up to this threat until it came to us. So uh, I love to talk about Estonia. It's one of my favorite little countries. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. It's just such a unique place. Um, I've been lucky enough to visit there many times through my work with NDI and then my work on this book. Um, but Estonia was one of the first places where Russian disinformation, as we know it today in the social media age and the internet age, was unleashed. Um, Estonia has got about 1.3 million people. It gained its independence in 1991 after the Soviet Union fell. And among those 1.3 million people, there are about 25% ethnic Russians, and, and the rest of the population is ethnic Estonian. Um, the ethnic Russian population came to be in Estonia because of the, uh, basically, the annexation of the Baltic states during the Soviet period, when the Soviet Union moved their Baltic Sea fleet to Estonia, to the port of Tallinn. Um, and after the Soviet Union fell, these ethnic Russians woke up in 1991 in a new country where they didn't speak the language. They didn't have really any connection ethnically or culturally to the land, except for the generations before them that had moved there to, to work in the military. Um, and they essentially became second class citizens in Estonia because Estonia created a really aggressive program to, to reboot Estonian culture, to, to hold on to what had been repressed for so long. Um, and so without passing an Estonian language exam, uh, you were not able to get Estonian citizenship in the post-Soviet era. And so many Russians 
not only did they lack uh, education because they were often blue collar workers, either in military or, or military industry, but they, uh, they, didn't, they weren't able to vote. They didn't have passports. They had what was called a gray passport, which would allow them to go back and forth between Estonia and Russia, uh, but not to travel further in, in the EU. Um, and they really weren't seen by the government. And as Estonia joined NATO and the European Union in the early 2000s, Putin saw an opportunity to exploit that ethnic fissure, that ethnic tension in Estonian society. What you see on your left is a statue called the Bronze Soldier. This was a statue that was in the center of Tallinn. It was a memorial to Soviet war dead. And the legend behind the statue was that, you know, the Soviet army drove the Nazis out of, of Tallinn and liberated the city. And Estonians found this statue, which had been put up in the late 40s after the war, as just extremely repugnant because it, it essentially in and of itself was disinformation. Uh, the, the Russian army, the Soviet army did not drive out the Nazis. The Nazis fled. Uh, and the Soviets filled the vacuum. And what followed was a period of repression in Estonia. Um, it was a period in which, you know, many Estonians family members were sent to gulags and work camps where people suffered uh, torture and, you know, political repression. And so this was a reminder of a very difficult period in Estonian history. However, in the independence period, it became a place where a lot of ethnic Russians would gather on what we call Soviet red letter days. So days like May Day or the day uh, when uh, Russians celebrate Victory Day, which is actually coming up in a few days. It's May 9th. Uh, that's the victory um, over fascism at the end of World War II. So they would gather here uh, in their you know, Soviet garb. And it was getting to be a flashpoint where Estonian nationalists would show up, Soviet nostalgists would show up and there would sometimes be altercations physically. And the new government in 2007 decided, you know what, we really have to move this statue. It is becoming too dangerous. It's a threat to public safety and we don't like the narratives that are being spread here. So they decided to move the statue to a military cemetery on the outskirts of town. And when I say the outskirts, you know, Tallinn is a very small city. So we're talking about a 10 minute drive, if that. Um, and there was also a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier that was attached to this monument that they, they decided to move. And this became the flashpoint for disinformation uh, between Russia and Estonia in 2007. The Russian language media, which were quite popular in Estonia, just piping over the border from St. Petersburg, uh, created all sorts of false narratives about the remains underneath the statue being desecrated, about the statue being removed and not put back up. Um, and really, it was meant to fuel this long running ethnic tension between the two groups. Uh, and what happened because of all of that instigation in the Russian language press, because of some involvement of the Russian security services who were on diplomatic passports, in, in Estonia, and also uh, paired with a cyber attack, there was just chaos in Estonia, which is normally a very, very quiet country. The riots broke out for two days. These cyber attacks, which originated in Russia, took down government services uh, and banking. And Estonia, you may know, is uh, the originator of Skype. They have um, a lot of e-governance in Estonia. It's quite a an online society. In fact, they often refer to it as e-Estonia, e-Estonia. Um, and this was a big deal. Uh, and that was a wake-up call for the Estonian government. They recognized, okay, we have a problem on our hands. But rather than just hermetically seal their information environment, rather than further push the, Estone, uh, the Russian citizens out from Estonian society, they decided to reach out to them. And they did that in part through education and by opening up the media sphere, by investing in the media sphere. So they uh, created a Russian language TV and radio station that was government funded rather than you know, relying on the media that was piped over the border from Russia. And they invested in educational initiatives, both in teaching Estonian language, but also in secondary education and university education so that Russian speakers would have the same educational opportunities as their Estonian counterparts. Because to that point, there were only private universities, which are quite expensive. And essentially, you could just 
by your degree uh, if you were a Russian speaker, but the quality of your education wasn't very good. So they created an outpost of the uh, most famous and oldest university in Estonia, Tartu University, that was made for Russian speakers. And it existed in the Russian enclave, the city of Narva. Um, and many years later, as the annexation of Crimea was happening, this is kind of a secondary wake up call for Estonia, and they redoubled these efforts. The uh, presidential administration moved to Narva for a short sabbatical in 2018 when I was doing the research for this book, and they, they were really investing a lot more in integration efforts so that there was an, a new identity for Estonia that didn't have to do just with Estonian language or Estonian culture. It was about Estonia being part of Europe and the opportunities that it afforded to their citizens, whether they were Russian speakers or Estonian speakers. And I think this just goes to show the importance of a holistic whole of society response to disinformation that includes investing in equipping people with the tools that they need to navigate a complex information environment. Sorry, just taking a sip of water. <laughs> um, so uh, there's another example that's a little bit wonky, um, but I think it's uh, also a little less rosy than the Estonian example. This is an example of, of failure and how to actually lose the information war. Um, without getting too much into detail, Ukraine, as you may remember, uh, when the protests in Ukraine broke out in 2013 and 2014, they were a result of Ukrainians demanding uh, a path to Euro-Atlantic integration. They really wanted to be part of Europe. They wanted to throw off the corrupt uh, government that they had had for many years, and they demanded of an old regime, the Yanukovych regime, um, that he pursue further integration with the European Union and distance himself from Russia. And he promised that he would, he reneged on that promise, and the protests that took him out of power uh, broke out and brought in a new administration. In 2016, after renegotiating what's called an association agreement with the European Union, uh, every individual EU member had to ratify that agreement in order for it to come into force. So Ukraine was very close to realizing that dream that had, you know, essentially started a war. A uh, hundred Ukrainians died during those protests. It was a very emotional thing. This is something that really uh, Ukrainians feel in their bones. And it's something that gets them out of bed every day, this idea of being part of Europe. And the Netherlands, uh, which is, you know, famously Eurosceptic, they like to have their rules about uh, their own rules about all sorts of things from marijuana to prostitution, very famously. Uh, they did not like the idea of Ukraine joining the EU, even though that's not what this referendum was about. It's an association agreement is essentially like a, an economic agreement, let's say. Um, and they saw this as an opportunity. Uh, essentially, there was a, a referendum provision and a new constitutional amendment that allowed them to vote on the association agreement. And so they brought this to a vote. Um, and the Dutch weren't the only people who saw an opportunity here to stop the EU association agreement. Russia, of course, saw an opportunity, and it was a dual opportunity, not just to stop EU's Ukraine's EU aspirations, but to undermine EU cohesion and EU support for Ukraine. Um, and it was a very interesting campaign that basically included all of the methods of the, uh, the influence playbook that I underlined before. There was information laundering in which the Russian outlet Sputnik would create false narratives in Dutch, and those narratives would get picked up by actors in the Dutch political environment who would uh, peddle them as fact in their own political engagement. There was a fake YouTube video, which you see on your left here, uh, that purported to show Ukrainian battalions threatening Dutch citizens and saying, if you don't vote in favor of this association agreement referendum, uh, we will come and we will commit terrorist acts, basically. And it was quickly debunked, but it didn't matter because so many people started watching it. And it, as you know, the I believe it's a fake Mark Twain quote, but uh, they say it's attributable to Mark Twain that, that Twain that the truth can get half. Sorry, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on, right? Um, and they sent actually fake Ukrainians to town hall meetings pretending to be Ukrainian. They were actually Russian citizens 
um, who went to the town hall meetings to pretend they were Ukrainian and discuss the referendum with Dutch citizens and say, no, Ukrainians don't actually want European integration. You don't want um, integration with Ukraine because they're a, a, a corrupt society, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we found out just a few, uh, a few months ago that there may have been funding flowing from Russia to Dutch political parties in order to vote against the referendum. So all of these tactics at play here. Um, and what ended up happening, despite a very valiant communications campaign by the Ukrainian government, they just couldn't compete. The truth, which was uh, very unsexy, just didn't compete with these salacious rumors that Russia was putting out there. And they lost the referendum. They had to find a, a diplomatic solution to it. And I like to tell this story um, because it shows, you know, we often hear people saying, if you just tell a good story, uh, we can beat disinformation. We just have to put the truth out there um, and do it in a way that's compelling. But that's not always true. The salacious, emotional uh, stories that appeal to our instincts and those pre-existing fissures in society often find more purchase within their audience than the facts. Um, mm. and, and as a result, uh, Ukraine has started investing more again in, in education. Um, this is something that they see as extremely important. They know they can't just play whack-a-troll. They know they can't just tell the truth well told. It, it has to be a holistic effort. And in this case, you know, they weren't able to educate Dutch citizens uh, because that was outside of their own sovereignty, of course. But, um, but it's something that they are trying to do at home. Um, you know, it strikes me that it, it, it's likely that many of the educators in our audience won't necessarily teach or talk to their students about Estonia or about uh, this issue with Ukraine. On the other hand, it seems like the big takeaway is that this was a um, this was a training exercise that that Russia actually you know they practiced in this in a small field before they you know graduated to the larger. Uh, United States target is is that fair to say is that, that these are while their intentions were certainly you know earnest and they they wanted to accomplish this there but what was it essentially just practicing for and, and fine-tuning their their process before they got to America yeah absolutely I often say that particularly in the case of Ukraine where there's just a I mean a raft of cases of disinformation from Russia um, Russia's auditioning its tactics. It's seeing what works right. in certain societies. It's perfecting them. It's trying out new technologies before they hit, you know, the big time, which would be the UK or the US. Um, and that's another reason that I think it's so important that we look at how our allies responded to these issues. Um, right. Because, w again, we, we tend to think we're the first that this has happened to, but there's a lot of lessons to be observed um, from these these early attempts, um, and we can learn a lot about the adversary there as well, as well as about ourselves, you know, looking inward and trying to solve some of the issues that are being manipulated by Russia, like endemic racism, like economic inequality, or, uh, you know, gun rights and things like that. If we are able to plug up those fissures, or at least, you know, smooth them over a little bit, we will be a lot more resilient when it comes to fighting back against disinformation, because that polarization won't exist to the same degree. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Oops. Okay. Um, so I always like to talk a little bit about what's going on in the States as well. Um, and this is uh, a campaign that I uncovered when I was in, uh, well, I was doing some research about Russian disinformation during the midterms. I'm not sure. Whoops, okay, it's taking me to um, a Google Drive thing. Now I've lost where you guys are. Do you see that? No, we, we don't see that. If you clicked a link, then we will not see it. So the okay. audience only sees the PowerPoint. So Got I think it, okay. Should, yeah. No worries. Well, I can describe what's in there. Um, so basically, I was looking for evidence of Russian disinformation during the 2018 midterms, and I found instead a an independent candidate for Senate who was running against Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, who used, again, information laundering um, and something called astroturfing when you use a bunch of fake accounts in order to give the guys of grassroots support, hence astroturfing. 
um, to his campaign. And what I came across was this uh, young woman, Donna Trumper. Obviously, she's got a strange name. And I said, that can't be a real person's name. So I did something, and this is something you can teach your students. Uh, it's called a reverse image search. I clicked on her profile picture on Facebook. Uh, I right clicked on it. And if you're using the Chrome browser, which is made by Google, you can actually just do this right in the browser. Um, and you click search Google for this image. And it will bring up all of the instances of that image on the internet, including the earliest instance of that image. And I tracked this image down to a young woman at the University of Virginia. Uh, her name was not Donna Trumper. She was a law student. And uh, her picture was being used on this fake account. And by following her online activity, which is what this uh, box on the right is, it's me scrolling through a bunch of posts that this fake account made, I found two other fake accounts, Eddie Decker and Patty Johnson. Eddie Decker's profile photo is from a hairstyle magazine, and Patty Johnson is, is just a, a generic photo on the internet that someone lifted and put uh, on this fake profile. And they would all be posting about this candidate. His name is Shiva Ayadurai, uh, in all of these anti-Elizabeth Warren, pro-Donald Trump groups, because he was trying to siphon off support from uh, supporters of Trump in, in Massachusetts. And um, you can look up this article, which I wrote for BuzzFeed News in 2018. Essentially, this was an account, a, a group of accounts, a network of accounts, about four or five accounts that posted hundreds and hundreds of times over the course of eight weeks, often one right after the other. So it was very clear that someone was logging into one account, logging out of another account um, with spam, essentially. Uh, they were copying and pasting words and links about this candidate. Um, and Facebook ended up taking all these accounts down when I, when I told them about this. Um, something that was also extraordinarily important was that they were doing this in groups. This is when I became concerned about Facebook groups as a vector for disinformation. Uh, this was right around when Facebook decided to prioritize groups in its uh, infrastructure of the platform. It was as people were getting more concerned about privacy and people said, you know, we want to hear from our friends and family. We want to connect with people on Facebook. We don't want to hear from news organizations or brands or political candidates. And so they drove people to groups, but groups where people trust one another, where, you know, you're often in a group with moms that you go to yoga with or uh, people who live in your neighborhood, you're less likely to scrutinize that information. And so we saw the same sort of dynamic along with um, these pro-Trump, anti-Warren groups in, in Massachusetts. And again, Facebook took down these accounts because they have a, um, a policy against fake accounts and they also have a policy against spam. And uh, these were breaking both of those policies. I wrote a, uh, a piece with a, another author in the disinformation space about groups last year, uh, oh, geez, almost a year ago now, uh, about how they are really truly these vectors for disinformation. I'm sure all of you are members of groups if you're on Facebook. Uh, Facebook has really been pushing this a lot lately. And it can happen across the political spectrum where these spaces, these trusted, closed communities are really places where disinformation can be seeded and amplified. And in fact, in the lead up to the 2020 election, we saw Russia using groups to spread disinformation and particularly targeting the liberal side of the political spectrum. So this isn't something that affects one side over the other. We are all vulnerable to it, especially if we've got our guard down as we do in groups. And so my co-author Cindy Otis and I both uh, make some recommendations for how Facebook might improve the, the group's ecosystem. And one of those recommendations that Facebook stop recommending groups to people because they often recommend, you know, conspiratorial groups uh, based on the algorithm that is operating on Facebook has already been implemented. So we were happy to see that. But there's other things that we recommend, like um, putting a cap on how many people can be in a group, putting a cap on how many people you can invite to a group, uh, making groups that are, you know, extremely large, not allowed to be private or secret, because that's where we see some of the really violent behavior happening. Um, that way, you know, there is some oversight over those groups, because just if you have a media organization, for instance, that has hundreds of thousands of readers, you don't get to do that privately, but you can have a private Facebook group where you plan 
um, some sort of violent event. And that has happened several times over the past couple of years. So we are pressuring the platforms about this, but I also think it's really important that all of us know to be on the lookout when we're on social media, even in these spaces that feel like they are trustworthy spaces. Um, even, you know, if you've got a closed account and you're a teenager on TikTok or on Instagram, um, there is a lot of ways, <laughs> there are a lot of ways that teenagers and individuals in closed spaces can still be targeted online. And we just need to know that that is what is happening, Re whether it's coming from Russia or coming from a politician or coming from people, frankly, who just want to make money. Uh, our emotions on social media are being weaponized and certainly our sense of security is as well. Um, Nina, um, just recently we hosted a, uh, a three week long virtual conference on artificial intelligence. It was titled oh, wow. in our image, the humanities and artificial intelligence. And we talked about a lot of uh, sort of the critical questions around AI from a humanistic perspective, issues like privacy, uh, uh, morality, uh, art, and creativity. I don't think we talked specifically about security, though. I wonder if, uh, before we move on, uh, you know, you've brought up uh, social media, you've brought up the algorithms. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of artificial intelligence, wh whether that's controlled and engineered by uh, a foreign actor or someone with some organization with, with bad intent or not? Does the algorithm itself lend to this? Does, does it happen whether someone's, you know, on the rudder or not? Yeah, so that's the difficult thing here. That's really the crux of the matter and why so many people are calling, for instance, for Facebook to be broken up or calling for more transparency around how the algorithms work on social media. So essentially, what happens when you are browsing any platform, uh, to a lesser extent Twitter, but especially Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, um, every interaction that you have on those platforms is being logged and analyzed by a piece of computer code on the opposite end. So they know how long you hover over a post. They know how many times you watch a TikTok video, whether you comment, share, download, like it. Um, they know if you react a certain way to certain Facebook posts or if you react to somebody more. They know where you're located. So for instance, I always see posts from my next door neighbor, even though she and I aren't particularly close that I would love to see posts from my college friends, but it, it wants to prioritize content in Arlington, Virginia to me. Um, and it, of course, knows also all of our browsing habits off of the platform as well. All of these apps will be tracking what you're doing when you're searching online. That's why when you see uh, ads for shoes that you were just looking at, they, they show up in your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed. They know when you click through on those ads to purchase something and all of that goes into a psychographic targeting profile so that you are getting content that you are most likely to engage with. And often that content, as I like to say, is the most enraging content. The most enraging content is the most engaging content. The stuff that we're most likely to react to is emotional. So if you feel yourself getting emotional, I'll get to this in a little bit, that's a great indication that you're being manipulated and that you maybe need to take a step back. So uh, my worry isn't necessarily that foreign actors are creating the AI that's doing this. It's that they know how to manipulate it. The same thing that's available to advertisers who want to sell us cute shoes or uh, what else do I get on my, my Instagram stuff? I get a lot of cat uh, products lately because my husband and I got a cat <laughs> last year. Um, they know that we have that cat and they're like, don't you want to get your cat a playpen so he can go outside? Uh, don't you want to get him this cute toy? Don't you want to dress him up like this? It knows, right? And in, in just the same way, it knows people who are engaged to be married. It knows people who are expectant parents. And uh, it allows foreign actors to target you at a very minute level of detail, not just your location, but if you're a fan of a certain TV show, let's say, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of correlation between uh, people who watch Duck Dynasty and people who are interested in gun rights. There's a lot of correlation between people who are interested in uh, yoga and holistic medicine to people who are anti-vaccination uh, uh, proponents. So uh, 
our, our adversaries know that and they're able to test all of that because you get an immense amount of data back when you are putting out those advertisements on social media and they can find, again, the audiences that are most vulnerable. So that's how AI uh, enables disinformation. Thank, thank you for explaining that. And it, and it seems like um, it seems like one of the, the common themes that you've shared throughout the night is that this provides then those with with poor intent. Let's use continue to use Russia as that example, that there are fissures they can exploit. So they're not necessarily creating the fissures. They're there already, but they're finding ways, they're perfecting ways and they're embedding ways for that to become disruptive in our society. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. Um, one other thing I, I should have mentioned before, uh, for those of you who are teaching um, teenagers in particular, Cindy Otis has a book called True or False, and it is about disinformation. It is targeted as like a um, an educational book for teenagers. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention my my friend and colleague's book, and I highly recommend it for those who are uh, working with, with teachers as well. Um, so getting to the end here, some key takeaways. Um, what are the things that we can do to, to counter disinformation? Uh, first, as I think you're probably all in, in you know, vehement agreement, I hope, um, we need what I call citizens-based solutions. So that is government and private sector investments in informational literacy, civics, cyber hygiene, and basic awareness building, that this is a thing that is happening and that we are all targets for it. It doesn't matter your age, your political inclination, your geographic location, you can be targeted. And in fact, the infrastructure of social media, whether you're looking at disinformation or an advertisement for cat products, uh, is doing that to you. And we all need to walk around with that awareness every day. Now, that doesn't mean I still don't sometimes buy things from Instagram ads. I do. <laughs> but I do it with a little bit more awareness. Um, the second thing is that we all need to be aware of vectors of homegrown disinformation. So that information laundering that I was talking about before, some people are unwitting vectors of, of dis and misinformation. Some people are playing into that uh, and they're doing so wittingly and they're doing so for political gain or for profit. And we need to recognize that as well. And then something I didn't really touch on as much today because uh, you're an audience of educators, but when I speak to Congress, when I speak to policymakers, I always remind them that disinformation is not a partisan issue. It is a democratic issue. Ultimately, our, our democracy, the very uh, structures by which we govern ourselves are the victims here. Um, and when I see political leaders trafficking in disinformation, uh, I just shake my head because we can't fight disinformation when we practice it ourselves. We can't be the pot calling the kettle black and say, when Russia does it, it's bad, but we're allowed to use uh, bots and trolls here. We're allowed to traffic in disinformation here just because it's American. That means it's okay. No, we need a fact-based authoritative source of information to be the basis for our dem our democratic choices that we make. You might not be able to see this, Nina, but uh, Mike, who is joining us tonight from Denver, Colorado, just literally got up off of his seat uh, to ask you, I'm going to go back uh, with your permission to that slide, to ask you to clarify uh, that, in fact, disinformation, this intentional disinformation is happening by Americans or American organizations. Is that right? Yes, um, and I hesitate to get too political tonight, but this is something that was, you know, put out by our intelligence community. So I'll just repeat what they said. A, a recent example um, from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, an assessment that's put together from all the nation's intelligence agencies, uh, military and law enforcement, um, found that actually in 2020, the biggest um, disinformation that we saw it did come from Russia, but it was laundered into the American information ecosystem. So um, allegations about uh, the Biden family's involvement in Ukraine were were created by Russian actors or Russian aligned people in Ukraine. And then they were shared um, to to influencers in American political life, one of whom was the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and, and several others in the American uh, political sphere 
who then amplified that disinformation, as is their right as Americans. Um, and they may have done so wittingly or unwittingly. We saw some uh, members of Congress um, amplifying such narratives as well. And this all fed into the uh, the narrative about the election being stolen, um, which of course caused the, the violence on January 6th. Uh, so it, it does have a, a direct effect on our democratic processes, as we have seen over the past year, it's had an effect on public health. Um, and it has an effect on public safety, because increasingly we see, you know, folks who are uh, who are going out and committing acts of violence, again, across the political spectrum, um, as fed by narratives that are untrue and, and in some cases are planted by foreign actors. Great, thank you. My pleasure. Um, so what can all of you do? I am really, really bullish on the role of teachers and librarians, in particular librarians. Um, the Pew Research Center found in 2017 that 78% of Americans of all ages across the political spectrum trust libraries to find information that is trustworthy and reliable. Um, we often talk about and we kind of fret, you know, what can we do in our federal education system to make sure that the, this curriculum is implemented since education is a state's right. And this is where, uh, you know, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities and our library system can come into play. Uh, libraries which are looking for their raison d'etre in the 21st century and which are in local communities which have uh, connections to their local populations and are trusted, especially by some of the elderly people who frequent them. This is a great vector through which to spread uh, really trustworthy information. And one program that I'm familiar with um, in, uh, in the Czech Republic actually um, is not done through libraries, but a community organization which trains elderly people in just basic computer literacy, but they use what I call the peas in the mashed potatoes approach. So in addition to teaching grandparents how to FaceTime with their grandchildren, they also, uh, they also teach them some basic information literacy with absolutely an apolitical bent, which I think is extremely important. Um, there was also uh, an example in Ukraine, which I've got some stats from on the uh, on the screen here, really interesting if you want to look that up, and I believe they have some um, resources as well for teachers. And then uh, I think it's also really important for educators to pull back the curtain on um, how the media works and, you know, the fact that there are media that have certain bents in our political system, and that is A-OK. -okay. We want lots of opinions, a plurality of opinions, but understanding what is typical journalistic practice, being able to identify opinion versus fact and fact-based reporting, understanding how journalists get their sources um, and, and the editorial process uh, that, that journalists go through in order to get their story published, or at least what they should be going through. And what are some indications of really quality journalism versus um, the stuff that citizen bloggers, which have a role to play in our information ecosystem as well, what's the difference there? And there's a lot of really great resources that the Pulitzer Center puts out. Um, I think that would be uh, a, a really good um, uh, place for some of you to go. And they actually do educational programs as well. They'll send in Pulitzer Center grantees who are journalists uh, to come talk to your classes. And I've been involved with some of those. So I would encourage you to look those up too. Um, and these are kind of the heuristics that I always recommend, uh, whether I'm talking to educators, or whether I'm talking to, to students themselves, or whether I'm talking to adult populations. What can you do? Um, first, consuming media. Um, we really want to make sure that uh, you're checking the source, right? If you're on a, a website that makes your spidey senses tingle, you're, you're wondering, okay, I'm feeling emotional now. What's going on here? This seems dubious. Check the source to see if it has contact information. Any legitimate media outlet is going to have not just a P PO box or, you know, uh, an online form for you to fill out. They're going to have a phone number. They're going to have a, a real address. See if the author has written other pieces. Now, this uh, if it's a really good information operation, they'll have you know a strong profile built out for this person. But if you look and see that the other pieces that this person has written are, are similarly dubious, um, then that's a good indication that it might be fake. 
you can check the text itself. Uh, you can just grab a little bit of it and drop it into Google. Often disinformation for monetary gain is just copy and pasted across the internet. So that's a good indication if you turn up another article that isn't from a newswire service um, and is just wrote copy and pasted, it might be a monetary operation. Um, you can do, as I mentioned before, the reverse image search. This is by far one of the most important uh, skills I think you could teach yourself or your students because we see a lot of visual misinformation where images are either misattributed and that might be you know, an honest mistake or it might be for malicious reasons. So Russia, for instance, loves to use pictures from uh, the Balkan Wars in the 1990s to represent Ukraine. Or we see this sometimes with natural disasters. Uh, we'll see a picture from a hurricane several years ago attributed to something that's happening today. Uh, in DC, every time we have floods of the Potomac River, someone shares a Photoshopped image of a shark swimming in the Potomac River. It is fake, and you can very easily find that out by using a reverse image search. So I encourage you to check that out. And then in general, just practicing social media skepticism, recognizing, again, the enraging, engaging dichotomy and knowing that that is the business model of social media, knowing that you are being manipulated. It's also extremely important to practice cyber hygiene and to, uh, to encourage your students to do the same. So two-factor authentication, uh, if you don't already have it or you don't know what it is, you're probably using it on some of your accounts, like your bank accounts, when you get a text message to put in a code. That's two-factor authentication. There's your first factor, which is your password, and then another factor which confirms your physical identity, that you are the person logging into the account. And it can do it through a text message that's slightly less secure because those can be intercepted. There are also physical security keys that you can order from uh, companies like YubiKey. And that is just something that you put in the USB drive of the device that you're using. There's other ones that work on Bluetooth also for your phone. But that means um, that you can confirm you are who you say you are when you're logging into your account. And this is important because if somebody steals your password, which has been happening on a lot of social media sites recently because they are not as secure as they say they are, um, they're not going to be able to log into all of your accounts. Now, uh, that is true as long as you are not using the same password for all of your account. And I highly, highly recommend if you can't handle two-factor authentication right now, get a password manager. Most of them are free. LastPass is the one I use, but 1Password is another one. And basically, you only have to ever use 1Password ever again uh, in your life. It will remember and generate complex passwords for you. Uh, that way, again, if, if some of your information is leaked, you will be protected. And this, how does this relate to disinformation? Well, as I mentioned before, there is this thing called malinformation where hack and leak operations have. It will also keep bad actors from uh, stealing your identity. And they might steal it to steal your money, but they also might steal it to use you and your identity in a disinformation campaign. And we've seen Russia do this before. And then finally, um, again, practicing what I call informational distancing, recognizing that uh, disinformation runs on emotion. When you feel yourself getting emotional, stepping away from your device before you hit share, before you comment, before you react, um, and really uh, doing all of those things that I just talked to you about, making sure that you're doing lateral reading, reverse image search, and teaching general awareness to your students about how social media functions, how does their TikTok algorithm feed them content? How do you get content that is given to you on, on YouTube when you search for uh, a video about coronavirus vaccines and then suddenly five videos later, you've been watching YouTube for an hour and a half and have fallen, fallen into a, a COVID vaccine uh, wormhole. How does that work? Teaching them about that, teaching them that that, that is uh, a possibility is so, so important. And then I, I always like to end my presentations with this quote from Thomas Jefferson, uh, which shows us that this really is not a new problem. Um, it looks different now than it did in 1820, but I really do agree with, uh, with President Jefferson when he says, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. So when we think about 
uh, all of the social media regulation that you know people are discussing every day these these days. When we think about playing whack a troll, that's only going to be a temporary solution. And what we need is to build a more resilient society, and that's going to be a generational effort. Um, but it's one that's worth investing in because it's it's about the health of our democracy, which we hope uh, is going to outlive us all. And so that is it for me tonight. I'm, I'm looking forward to answering more of your questions. I'm not sure how much time we have left. I know I've talked quite a bit, but it's been a pleasure <laughs> to be with you. Nina, thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes and we have actually quite a few questions that are queuing up. So uh, I'm gonna share these with you in, in the order that seems to make sense to me. And um, if you can answer them you know, pretty tightly, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, the, the first question uh, I'm gonna bring to you comes from Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is a teacher in Los Angeles Unified, and he's wondering if you can speak a little bit to what you think the ultimate end game is for, for organizations or people or countries behind this mis- and disinformation uh, campaign. Sure, it's, cha it's chaos, it's panic, it's rage, but, but what comes next? Is it global takeover? Is it, is it one world government? Is it social Darwinism? Like, wh where does this take us? Well, I think the idea is really uh, to denigrate the democratic order. And if countries like Russia, just speaking from you know where I have the most experience, are able to be left alone and to gobble up smaller, you know, less uh, powerful countries as they please, to mine them of their resources, both physical and human, um, I think that's what they're going for. I don't think. Well, I don't. I never claim to know what Putin is actually thinking, but I don't think he would want world domination. China might want that. Uh, Iran wants, you know, to be left alone, to not be uh, have, you know, a, a, a existential threat from from Israel as it views it. Um, but but ultimately, I guess the idea is to lessen hegemony from the West and uh, to have a little bit more of an anarchist world politics situation, at least from, from the perspective of the country I know best, which again is Russia. Mm. Um, they would prefer us not to be involved, to not be calling them out constantly on all of the issues that we see in their own governance and how they treat other countries. Great, thank you. This question comes from Robert. Robert's joining us from Durham, North Carolina. He's wondering if you can speak to uh, this question. In your view, what policies might Congress enact to police its own members regarding willful dissemination of disinformation in order to set a credible example? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of things come to mind. Um, President Biden was actually one of the only presidential candidates to sign a pledge against using disinformation in his campaign. Uh, Elizabeth Warren also did that later on in the campaign, but she kind of created her own pledge. President Biden signed a, a pledge that many campaigns around the world, many uh, candidates were signing called the Transatlantic Election Integrity Pledge. And uh, he, I think, sets a really good example for the behavior that we should be exemplifying, not only um, as you know, leaders in the United States, but our own politicians should be exemplifying around the world. I would love to see candidates on both sides of the aisle at all levels of government sign up to that pledge or a similar pledge. And we, again, have seen folks on both sides of the political spectrum around the world doing the same thing. Um, what Congress can do, uh, it gets pretty difficult um, and contentious up there on, on Capitol Hill um, because this issue has become so politicized. But one of the things that they can do is uh, force transparency on um, political advertising. So uh, since 2016, there has been a bill in Congress that has never been voted out of Congress uh, because of the political nature of it. It is bipartisan, currently sponsored by Senator Amy Klobuchar and Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, that would uh, essentially make it easy for people to see online advertisements and who paid for them. Just like we know, uh, you know, at the end of every TV ad, it says, I'm Joe Schmo and I approve this message. It would say the same thing on our, uh, our, our advertisements online. Currently, we don't have that. And so we can have a lot of opacity in that. That would, that would be one step. Another step is 
uh, really making sure that um, those tactics, those disinformation tactics that President Biden and other candidates around the world have pledged not to use are not allowed to be used in election campaigns. Right now, there is no disincentive not to lie in your election campaign, which I think is pretty bad. And, you know, we, we are used to politicians uh, bending the truth, but this goes beyond that. That's bending the truth at an industrial scale using psychographic targeting, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would love to see some rules introduced that are enforceable by the Federal Election Commission that can crack down on this stuff. And then finally, there are rules about what you can say and do on the floor of Congress. Um, each chamber, the House and the Senate, have different rules that govern their um, proceedings. But I would love to see more stringent rules about the airing of disinformation and conspiracy theories on the floor of the House and Senate. We've seen some similar stuff introduced in the House this year relating to um, the uh, marking privileges that members have. So the stuff that they can pay for with congressional funds to send out to their constituents, I, I think we need to go further than that. Um, and so those are just a couple of quick things that we mm -hmm. can do. Uh, obviously, there's also, you know, a lot to be said about social media regulation as, as well, but that would be a whole other 90 minute session. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so this question then uh, will be more of a personal one. Uh, meaning how to deal with this on a one-to-one -one level. This comes from Jessica, who's joining us from the Shepherd Center. She's wondering if you have any uh, advice or uh, effective methods in your own life uh, to, without shame, explain to someone that they're spreading disinformation. How, how do you let people know that, they're, that they've got it wrong? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, and frankly, uh, even though I know the best practices, I, I do have a... a cousin um, who has fallen prey to some of this, and we have a, a quite a difficult relationship right now. But what the, the folks who are experts on this say to do, and I, I, I should say also that these are folks who are, who've studied extremism and, and bringing people out of cult-like situations, because essentially that's what we're dealing with here. The, the first thing is, if they've shared something on a social media platform that is just plain wrong, do not call them out uh, publicly. <laughs> so you, you've got to do it privately. So either pick up the phone, send a text message, a DM, whatever, um, and say, rather than, you know, hey, what you shared is wrong. Here's a link to Snopes. Um, ask them a question. Say, um, hey, Johnny, I noticed you shared this article. I was wondering uh, what what appeals to you about it or what makes it interesting and try to hear them out because often again there's that kernel of truth that uh that real life fisher that has appealed to them to share it and maybe they feel left behind economically maybe um they're out of work or maybe you know they lost a parent to uh, to COVID or something like that. And they, uh, you know, I'm just making things up off the top of my head, but maybe there's something that's inspiring. They're, uh, they're seeking out of this information. And maybe you can gently, after understanding, you know, what it is that's inspired them to get to that direction, um, nudge them in a different direction, nudge them in the direction of something that is authoritative information that addresses their concern. And the problem mm. is it's not a one and done situation. It takes time um, and it can be pretty exhausting. And in my recent experience, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get my, my cousin to take the, uh, the COVID vaccine. Um, and I asked him why it was he didn't want to take it and uh, he wouldn't answer me. So that we're at an impasse now, but just gently recognizing, you know, that this is something that isn't going to be um, done overnight, that it, it takes long term engagement and that it's best done in private with a lot of empathy, I think, is the best starting point. Uh, absolutely. Two more questions before we conclude tonight. Um, the next to last question, Nina, is, you know, we're talking about social media. There's actually a lot of conversation in the audience chat around, you know, to to either leave social media or not. And I noticed that on the screen right now we have your Twitter handle. You've mentioned Instagram a few times, Facebook. So you're, you're using social media. So it seems like it's not an either or kind of thing. Talk to us a little bit about the way that you balance being engaged in social media with the realities that you've shared tonight. Yeah, that is a great question. So <laughs> I have endured my fair share of trolling, both from, you know, Russian uh, entities, as well as some folks who have different um, 
political opinions than me. There are a lot of people who pick on me on Twitter simply because I am a woman. Um, and I'm, that's what has driven a lot of my interest in, in gendered abuse and disinformation online. Um, for me, I still think despite the issues, the benefits outweigh uh, the, you know, the, the negatives here. Um, I, I do still believe in the power of social media to connect people. I have met some really great friends on whom I, I rely um, very much on Twitter, um, colleagues as well. Uh, Facebook has become less useful for me over the past several years. I used it a lot as a college student. Um, I used it, you know, in, in my graduate school days. Uh, I used it a lot when I was traveling and living in Ukraine, but it's become, um, as, as the, you know, psychographic targeting has increased, it's become less useful for me. So I, I use it more as a professional platform now. And then, yeah, Instagram, I actually find quite positive in my life. Um, despite the advertising, I love to see pictures of beautiful places that people have been. But I try to put parameters on all of my social media engagement. I don't um, let myself do too much of it. Twitter is the hardest one for me because it is directly connected to my work. So sometimes I just try to stay off of Twitter uh, on the weekends, which is not as easy as it, it seems. Um, and I've recently gotten on TikTok too, which I had resisted for a very long time, but finally relented because it's a totally different audience of people. It's a fun, creative medium. Uh, there are some concerns about privacy on TikTok, but um, I think for professional reasons, it has proven to be a really interesting uh, medium of communication for me and a, a way to reach more people. And that's why I'm on social media. Um, I want to, you know, I want to educate people and I want to um, try to shed light on some complex issues for them. And if social media empowers that, then maybe it's undoing some of the bad that it's doing elsewhere in the world. But I, I do yeah. think we all need to put, you know, parameters on it and not just spend all of our time on social media all the time. Certainly. Uh, last question, Nina. Um, it, as best as you can answer this. Are, are you optimistic? Uh, it used to be a, a firm yes. Um, I have become less optimistic this year. Uh, as we were talking about right before you opened up the room, Andy, um, January was really, really difficult as a disinformation scholar and as a Washingtonian, frankly. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in the nation's capital for over a decade now, and to see it locked down that way in a frankly i haven't even seen barricades like that in my travels in uh places like russia where you know it, it essentially is to some degree a police state um it was it was difficult and to know that disinformation fueled all of that um and that it i don't know if it was fully preventable but we at least could have anticipated it more we could have taken measures to uh, to really stem the flow of some of that extremely harmful information. Um, as a reminder, you know these are all private platforms, so they can take any moderating actions that they want to. And I think there was just so much politicization of this topic, which again, in my opinion, should not be politicized at all. This is about public safety, public health, and and the functioning of our democracy. Um, so that has been really difficult. But I do think there are solutions. Uh, my book is called How to Lose the Information War, but ultimately it ends on a hopeful note. It, it talks about, you know, all of the ways that we can build over time our resilience and couple that with some of the uh, more short term measures to create a society, an informational environment that is more equitable, more democratic and more just. And I think we just need to commit ourselves to that. And so far, we haven't seen our leaders do that. We haven't seen the media do that. Um, and sometimes I feel like I'm shouting into a void, but then I also get some really great events like this one tonight uh, with really thoughtful questions and, and they give me hope. So yes, I am still very cautiously optimistic. Fantastic. Nina Jankowicz, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight and reaffirm that optimism. Uh, it's certainly my view that as educators, uh, you are the solution. And I hope that tonight's session was helpful uh, as, as you wrapped your brain around these issues and then uh, gave you a, a renewed sense of purpose for the work that you do, uh, both at the conclusion of this year, but certainly as you prepare for next. And it does occur to me that this issue, as much as any, is the 
single most important role uh, that educators can play in, in addressing this for our, our, our citizenry. Um, please do, I feel now a little bashful saying this, please do follow our social media to get uh, updates and opportunities both for the rest of the spring as well as for the fall uh, 2021 school year. Um, I'm, uh, again, I want to thank you for joining us for all of our webinars this year, and I hope to see you uh, join us next year. We'll be getting our uh, our series in early September. Uh, please have a great conclusion to this year. It's been uh, the most disrupted and uh, difficult probably uh, in a long, long time. I, I too am uh, cautiously and, and maybe even very optimistic that uh, next year you'll return to uh, a much more nor normal state, at least in terms of working with your students. Uh, registration for next year opens on August 16th. I hope to see many of your names on the roster. Have a great summer. Please do keep in touch. Email me anytime with questions or thoughts. Uh, we'll see you next time in the Humanities Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Have a great summer.